Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Shaft Podcast. My name is Andrews, and today I'm hosting um, an amazing individual who has risen through the ranks of debate, been competitive over a period, but also explored speech in a much more intricate and persuasive way. Um, even during the period when this person was speaking, the speaking identity was there. It was clearly much more stylistic than a lot of debaters that you would see. And there was a deliberate effort into choosing words, expressions in a way that made it much more persuasive. Eventually, this individual was crowned public speaking champion of the world, probably the first person to be crowned um, at that extent in the apex of the game from Ghana and from West Africa as well. And so with me here is a University of Ghana Debate Society legend, um, Jeremiah Sechi. Jeremiah, welcome to this episode of the Shaft Podcast. Hello, Andrews, and thank you for that elaborate introduction. <laughs> how have you been? Uh, how are you doing? It's been a while since, since we caught up. It's like now the debate space, we barely see you. You are, you are becoming part of the history. It's, it feels too soon. It, it does feel too soon. I mean, I believed I was due for at least three Accra openings after finishing school. Yeah. Maybe two Hogwarts or so, a number of Genesis. And then I would finally hang, hang my coats. But retirement has caught me earlier. As we were talking about earlier, old age is inevitable. Mine just crept in slightly earlier than planned. Because uh, it's... It, if, I don't know. Some of you people make me feel old in the sport because you, all of you have left. And these days, when I show up to any competition, people are like, "Your age mates are doing this, and they are not coming, and, and they are off, and they are not coming." If, the worst of it all is my age mates who come and compete and decide not to break. So, like you see them, they oh, competing, yeah. but they are not breaking. So, if I do competitive, then I, I become the outlier. And, and you guys retiring early is really harming my chances in the sport. So, well, my deepest apologies. <laughs> Retirement was not a choice of mine. Uh, if I had my way, I would have still been doing a number of opens from time to time. Yeah. But some of these things are determined by fate, not by human will, which is a debate we can go into. But <laughs> I think we can leave it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things that um, I noticed about you, and I think a lot of people would confirm this, is you had a unique way of speaking in, when you were in debate. It's one of the one of the people I would hear from afar and know this is your speech. And I could tell to detail, even if not by the voice, maybe to the extent that someone would quote, probably because we were competitors at the time, and I would say maybe I was studying your speeches to understand how to meet you. Um, but... It, it felt like you had a unique identity of speech style and also the way in which you sound. Was it deliberate or was that just who you were and how you spoke and that expression just came out as one that sounded great as opposed to something that you deliberately and intentionally worked on? I believe it was to an extent deliberate. Yeah. To some extent, you could say that it's an extension of who I am. I prefer to choose my words deliberately. But in debate, I realized that it was not just a personality trait. It was a means to an end as well, because every word had a purpose it was serving in driving home that argument, driving home that point. And I chose to use those elements to elevate my speech to a degree. Was it effective? I mean, that is still up for debate as to how far it took me. <laughs> but... I truly believe that in terms of communicating, even beyond debating, it was important to ensure that every single word was deliberate so as to elicit a specific effect. So I was a little bit clinical with how I chose my words and how I emphasized my words and how I made sure it went across. Just in terms of strategy, that was my approach at that time. Yeah, I mean, you're even doing it now, like your your choice of words. 
And I, the way in which I think about this is, could you have said this in different ways? Yes. The, the way in which you specifically choose to say it, make it sound up there. Yes. And then that confirms that there is probably some intention around how you sound. But you mentioned that you do this to communicate a specific effect. Um, is that to say for a lot of, and this is even beyond debate as well, is that to say for a lot of the times speaking does not always achieve communication? And if that's the case, what's the difference between the two elements or the two spheres of, of activity? What are you doing when you are speaking? What are you doing when you are communicating? And what, what drives the difference between the two? Excellent. What I believe is the difference is that speaking is part of communication. Yeah. Right. So the way I see it, speaking is the least rewarding, least effective element within communication. Ooh. And all speaking does is for you to just let out words, let out words. But communication goes far beyond that in terms of including listening, including body language, including yeah. emotional expression, emphasis, intonation. All of these things play an important role in communicating more than just information. And that is the distinction between speaking and communicating. Speaking transfers information. Communication shares understanding and experience. So communication occurs when you are able to achieve a unified understanding. Okay. And there are so many examples of this. So, for example, when someone is just speaking, of course, you hear information. When the person uses their hands, you may be communicating urgency, gravity, and communicating of course has definite objectives so at the end of this exercise i want you to understand abc i want you to believe xyz i want you to do one two three when we are done and that is why communication is on a larger scope than speaking uh, i've i've probably heard different people describe communication as different from speaking i've also heard different people at least assert it. But to be very honest, I hadn't heard anyone explain it in a way that probably distinguishes it clearly for me as you've done. And it's a profound thing when you say speaking is the most least rewarding because like when you grow up and you are thinking about communicating, the most of thing you think about is saying something like speak mm -hmm. and, and that should be communication, right? Like. And so sometimes it, that's why it shocks people when they are like, I tell you this and you don't listen. Or I tell you this and you're not doing it. Because to us and to a lot of us who feel like we are communicating, we interchange them to be synonymous that speaking is communicating. Once I'm speaking, I should be communicating something. But what you just said is speaking is the least rewarding element. But it's also seen as the most... Uh, active way for people to communicate is that some form of cultural misunderstanding or is it the fact that that is what we hear so the fact that speaking comes with a voice and we hear it but maybe moving your hands or um, sort of ensuring a conducive environment creating that emotional connection that you would make the person understand you those ones are little bits of intangible elements and so we tend to deprioritize them if speaking is that not rewarding, why is that so much prioritized when it comes to communication? Well, you did explain that to an extent, which was that speaking, of course, appears to be more tangible. It appears to be more definite. I want this person to understand this, and I'm saying this to achieve that effect, yeah. as opposed to using your hands and using other elements of communication. Also because speaking gives you a sense or an illusion of control that Ooh. by doing this i can achieve a definite effect that is why people resort to speaking as opposed to communicating communicating yeah. is perhaps realizing that it's friday at 4 p.m and i'm supposed to give a speech yeah no one cares about what i am going to say everybody wants to go home yeah and so in my speech i need to make it concise i need to make it entertaining and i need to perhaps include a line by saying that guys, I know we are all in a hurry to go to the pub, have a few drinks after this meeting, but I implore you, if you give me five minutes, I am going to make it worth your while. Not adding a sentence like that would ensure that you have spoken for five minutes 
and it would achieve no effect. And that is why commit speaking is to an extent the least rewarding. And another reason why I believe speaking is the least rewarding is that when you're speaking, there are some instances where speaking allows you to explore certain parts of your mind that you have not. Sometimes you may ask me to explain something to you and in trying to answer your question, I would unlock parts of yeah. my thinking that I have not previously done before. You have that experience in POIs. Yeah. You may not yeah. have an answer to that in your case, but the person asks you a POI and your mind explores that possibility and brings up an answer. Speaking can do that for you, but the way I see it, speaking can only, it only involves giving out what you already have. Yeah. When you are able to communicate, listen, pick up on cues, what you do is that after you have spoken, you have also gained information by observing your listeners, by being able to interact with them, by picking up on signals, communicating with other gestures. You are able to build more and live with more after you are done yeah. from that particular experience. So that's why I believe speaking is less rewarding. However, not any less powerful. I mean, we all know about great speakers who have done yeah. amazing things with their speech. I have a dream. Yes, we can. All of these titular legends, but yeah. even more, furthermore, they would have been unable to do all the great things they did if they were not previously studying and understanding their audiences, being able to watch them gather the public consciousness and express it and channel it through their speeches. So yeah, I believe that is how I'd address that issue. I think what I'm getting here is communication is really more of a journey and speaking is probably just one of the stops along that journey where you come from exactly. an understanding, you come through observation, you come to appreciating those observations and understanding how to interact with them and then reflecting those observations in your speech to achieve that desired that desired end. I think I, I genuinely, I don't think a lot of us understand communication this way to really because how how many of us um, when we really want someone to do something we are probably not gauging okay what mood are they in what what like thing did they say yesterday that may trigger something that i want to see um where are they now we probably don't factor in a lot of the context we just communicate and expect it to do we just speak and expect it to do magic so this is this is me me I've, I've gotten a wisdom nugget i'm going to use it somewhere <laughs> yeah I've, I've always said like what the, one of the fun things about doing this is not just really getting to sit down and exploring like people's minds like i'm doing with you now it's equally getting to be, sometimes be the first person who hears some of these things and it's really fascinating that i'm learning a lot like from interviewing people from talking to people because sometimes the way in which you know this thing where we have things in our minds it's somehow rough you don't have a way to clearly have a grasp of it until someone reflects mm -hmm. it on you and then you clearly understand and i think it's one of the most rewarding things i, I get from doing this and this one i'm going to write it somewhere definitely i'm using it <laughs> yeah but that is very good yeah 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 you you've been so this clearly says you've been much more conscious in this sense in terms of debating and even in terms of outside communication um as well but what sparked your interest in that because all of us grow up and i'm not sure all of us turn up to understand language and communication and its effects on people like you have and you are explaining and these are things that i am getting to understand now that you have had a grasp of way back um, 2018 2017 since i saw you 2019 as well um what sparked that interest for you to did you have to search for it was it an experience that you had growing up that shaped your understanding of communication in a way that made you much more conscious of it yes and this is where I reveal some things that are not clear publicly. Yeah. And that is where, about my debating journey, for example, I think people believed that I 
refined my communication skills to be a better debater. But it was the other way around in that mm. I used debates and public speaking because I wanted to be a better communicator. Okay. It was always a means to an end for okay. me. And that is because growing up, I became someone who was fascinated by the power of communication. Yeah. I would watch a movie and my favorite part would be the villain's monologue or the hero's oh. monologue at the end. Okay. Or I would watch a speech or I'd watch a US presidential debate and I would yeah. love the point where they all come in and explain their platforms and you know have that banter there. And it was just about the power of communication. For me it was always fascinating how someone would stand on a stage and say a few words and ten thousand or a million yeah. people are going to be gingered to sacrifice their lives, are going to be inspired to go home and do something. That short exercise for me was more powerful than maybe any bomb that humanity could drop on another country because yeah. this was what would even inspire that person. I mean, Winston Churchill would just say a few words and millions of British people would go themselves yeah. to go and die in battle just because yeah. they had been possessed by a certain spirits that someone communicated from their speech and that was yeah. to me an interesting concept i mean this is going to make me sound a bit megalomaniacal but i have always been fascinated by how people were able to influence inspire and control people with their communication yeah. so that was something that i had an interest in i found in high school that debating was going to be a means for me to achieve that so I picked up debating. I realized that human beings don't always respond to logic. Yeah. Most at times, human beings do not respond to logic. That is why, I mean, we have certain political parties in the system. So I realized that I needed something else that, that would respond to. What? The shit that you just threw. About, about, oh, well, I mean. <laughs> about certain political parties in the system. I mean, if I, if we can say some, not all, sure, maybe. But I realize that logic does not always yeah. persuade people. Yeah. People respond to other things, emotional, sentimental, yeah. and other elements. And I realized that, okay, this is important. Let me pick up public speaking as well. And that's what determined how I approached these things. Yeah. So I'll be watching a lot of Trevor Noah. I'll be watching a lot of Stephen Colbert, yeah. John Oliver. I took a lot of psychology as well. Oh. I studied Aristotle's theory of persuasion. Yeah. And these were all the steps that I took because I wanted my communication journey to build up from my debate and public speaking experience yeah. and not to be a means to an end for a trophy i mean i love the trophies i still have them around but yeah. it was always a means to an end for me yeah um <laughs> when you mentioned the trophies i just wanted to chip in that you won world's public speaking um mm -hmm. and was that planned as part of the things you wanted to explore within this beat or was that it came along the line and how much of of deliberate speech prep went into that because the reason why worlds within public speaking usually fascinates me is that's a space where almost everyone is different right this is different cultures different identities different religions different preferences different choice of words mean different things to different people and so for you to be able to move the crowd in ways that when you public speaking, the expectation is that you you should be very, very good at it, right? And so was that calculated? Was that planned? Did you work on it? And how, how much did that mean to you um, when it came along? Yes, so for winning public speaking the previous tournament i was there in the, i believe it was world 2018 mexico yeah and i made it to the semi-finals of public speaking which was 
unexpected, very surprising. Yeah. I didn't put in much effort into that. Okay. But then I realized that, okay, I had been able to make it to semi-final. It was possible to progress. Yeah. And this was without any prior preparation. So coming back from that tournament, I decided to spend that year preparing and refining myself for the next tournament. And the way I saw it, public speaking, because of the progress I had made, I obviously had a greater ability for public speaking yeah. than I did for debate. And it was understanding that, knowing the dynamics within the space, yeah. but still understanding that this was where I could get the greatest title from and yeah. the most credibility for my journey from. So I began to work on it and it also involved understanding that audience. Like you mentioned, yeah. you had people from different parts of the world. So it was watching what they watched. Okay, yeah. What do they watch in the US? What do they watch yeah. in the UK? What do they watch in the in Europe? Like I mentioned, yeah. watching people like Trevor Noah, John Oliver, trying to understand what these people found interesting, what they found funny, what they responded to, yeah. and building my material off that, understanding those audiences, watching interviews of people. And it was a year-long journey doing that. And I'll say that's one of the most rewarding steps I have taken because currently in my line of work where I work as a communication consultant for people yeah. to, all over the world, I do a lot of this, trying yeah. to speak to them, understanding them, and getting to know what works for them. And that journey truly benefited me in that regard. But more so on the journey, getting there, I had to adapt my speech towards every particular audience so i had a speech prepared that i used for nationals yeah and i got some feedback there so i took all of those tournaments nationals and pants as training for worlds wow that year i tested those speeches there assessed how they did took back some feedback and tried some risky things if it didn't work i didn't really mind because yeah. i was aiming towards the world's tournaments so building up from there, and that is why, quite interestingly, my only public speaking trophy was the World Tournament. Didn't win the Nationals, didn't win the Pants, but it was only the Worlds. Wow. And getting to the World stage, what I realized then that this was a chance for me to build credibility as a communicator. Yeah. Even till date, when we go for a company event or I travel somewhere, and I have to give a speech, they still introduce me as yeah. world public, nice public champion. Speaker. Yeah. And it seems very impressive to those audiences because they think about someone who was at the time the best communicator in the world. Yeah. And it has been able to build that credibility for me. And when I get into that room, I have CEOs of multinational corporations listening to me, paying attention thinking yeah. that they are going to hear words of wisdom when I speak because yeah. of what that record did. So that was the main reason why I pursued that intentionally yeah. because I wanted to be a renowned and respected communicator. And having records like that played a role yeah. in getting that credibility. So that was the motivation behind my journey. The the fascinating aspect of this is is eventually for me not even the fact that you won because it looks like you really worked on it and so it was inevitable. It was having a big picture beyond winning, right? That what was I winning this for? I was winning this for an end goal to and it sort of fits into the thing you've been saying debates and public speaking has been for you. It has always been a means to an end to build your communication, to build yourself and to develop your capacity. And I think knowing that this was a good jig to have within within the pack and then make use of it as well. It's it's like, yeah, people sit and plan like that, Charlie. Seems, seems interesting because I know lots of people. I mean, I started um, seeing debate equally as a means to an end maybe somewhere last year. Um, when I did the mm -hmm. Noah Debates Ambassadors program and then I started realizing mm -hmm. that I could make more from debate than just competing with it. Um, and so I changed my mindset towards it. Since last year, I've done very few competitive competitions, but I still enjoy the debating space more. 
Um, and so very few of us actually do debate with the mindset of having an end goal that we are unlocking these achievements for. Most of the time, it's just competing within the moment. And then when we are done, we rant about it and shift to the next comp. So it's like, it's fascinating seeing that this um, approach of thinking, and I'm happy now that these things are being spoken about also because I'm sure some first year debater or upcoming debater would listen to this and eventually start rethinking of what am I using this for? So it becomes a step to bigger things rather than just competing and competing and not really having an end goal that you are practicing and training for. So congrats, congrats again. And for me, it's like, I, I was telling someone this because we've had a long list of, of public speaking champions and finalists from Ghana since then. We've had Apreku win it. We've had Zoe win it. We've had Kelvin Damte win it. Um, just at the end, just ended WDC. We've had so many finalists from Ghana as well in public speaking. And the first person I had do it was you. And around that time, I didn't even know where else had a public speaking category. So it's like you, I'm sure, and people can deny this all they want, but I'm sure the reason why Ghanaians started knowing or even had a sense of belief that it's possible to win public speaking was because you did it. And it was like, yes, it's possible. I can work on it. And also because I'm sure people would reach out to you for advice. You see it, public speaking competitions in Ghana and Accra open help build up a culture of quality public speaking that have gone up to produce eventual world champions. And Ghana has felt the touch of having public speaking champions within the circuit and Africa as a whole as well. So like massive congrats on that. And and it's a legacy that nobody can take away from you. The most I'm happy about, it's that you experience it every single step of the way in, in the journey that you are on as well. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Just a little bit on drawing ourselves into the modern era. There's been concerns about how disruptive digital platforms have been to communication. There have been concerns about how disruptive they have been to people's attention in a way that deprives us of the edge to communicate with other people. So we sort of want to be merged into these digital platforms, chasing tweets and likes and, and, and follows and all that. What do you think of this? Do you think really that is, that is what digital platforms and technology is doing to communication? And how bad has it, how bad is it if you think that's really the case? Firstly, I have a bias on this okay. because I work remotely, so yeah. I have an obvious bias yeah. for this. But beyond that, I'm going to be I'm going to try to be as objective as possible yeah. on this matter. I believe that there is a need for a balance in terms of how people communicate. Obviously, this is an amazing, groundbreaking yeah. innovation that allows people all around the world to communicate and connect. Yeah. There are some people I would have never met in my or have been unsustainable to either meet them yeah. repeatedly or even ever meet them yeah. if not for these platforms that allowed someone I mean, to this, their PC. This thing we are doing. Exactly. Even yeah. this thing we are doing now is someone else in Amsterdam or yeah. in Sydney or in London just connect their PC as well and we are communicating yeah. as though we are in the same room. I don't think we take enough time to realize how truly remarkable and unthinkable this would have been even 10 years ago yeah. or maybe 20 years ago. So I do not take it lightly that it's a massive miracle yeah. that we are living in. Beyond that, I can attest to how beneficial it has been for me in particular. My first job was doing trainings like this, working with debate mates. And it was interesting how I met my boss there. We met in a queue for food in oh, Thailand wow. when okay. I was attending the World Championships. Yeah. I believe my boss then had seen me debate or seen me doing public speaking in the yeah. previous tournament and just offered me a job right there and then wow. in the queue for food for supper that day. I took her email, reached out when I got to Ghana, and we've been working for the past 
five years wow. or so. And that has how it, that is since 2019 yeah. to a smaller degree, officially 2020 to now. And it has been a beautiful working relationship. Wow. Open the door to so many places. And all of that has been possible through this means of communication. Yeah. So I'd say that it provides an opportunity for us to connect. Eventually, I've been able to travel, meet them, go to conferences, go to speaking events. But it all began yeah. from here. This low barrier of entry space that allows everyone to just buy data and not a, an expensive plane ticket yeah. and be able to have an international experience. So that, I believe, is a great thing. Should it be our only means of communication? I do not think that is so. I think it's a great substitute, but it must always be understood that it is a substitute. Okay. Ideally, we are going to be in the same room. When I see you across the room yeah. and we talk, and communication is much more enriching that way. But this is a substitute that offers similar quality. Yeah. But the true miracle, the true benefit that it brings is what it makes possible yeah what it makes possible and that is why i think it's great i mean you can attest to that i believe you've done a lot of online tournaments yeah a lot. and i i i have done a few of them as well yeah i believe it was uhuru welts yeah yeah, yeah 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 and these tournaments brought together people that i may have i may have never met i partnered someone from south africa and that would not have been possible yeah. or would have been very difficult to do having to buy tickets and meet at a place and it's very important to talk about the costs i mean we are in africa yeah. and even if even if the schools are willing to pay they may not pay for as many teams yeah. and may not pay for as many individuals to go and let's say they even do that it may not be as consistent we have yeah. seen Yes, that even universities like mine were not able to attend world for the same purpose. So yeah. having a format that allows you to build that experience is great and it is in itself rewarding. In the space of the world of work, like I mentioned initially, I work remotely and I've seen to a great degree how this means of communication is still practiced in the world of work. I do 90 to 95 percent of my work remotely yeah and that includes consulting for companies and consulting for individuals in terms of communication yeah. i need to teach them how to communicate in person while communicating online. online yeah 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 and that is a testament to how effective this means of communication can be even beyond debating so i would say that for those who have the opportunity to do this it should not be seen as a lesser form but it's a different format okay on its own even being a substitute it's not only a substitute but it is also a different form i was surprised to see some jobs that actually required people to have experience working remotely yeah yeah, yeah. and that was because these companies understood that this virtual communication is not just another means of substituting yeah. the conventional means of communication, but had its own set of skills and requirements that it brought to the table. It had unique means of communication in order to be effective. Yeah. So I realized that it is also valuable and distinct in its own aside being a substitute. And that is why I think for everyone who is confronted with it should take the chance to use it to their advantage. Yeah, this um interesting because usually people tend to compare this with what it should be which is or oh, it should be in person so the digital version is, is substandard rather than comparing it to what it would have been which is an absence totally of communication um and so when you sort of pick the lens from different sides, you get to appreciate it on different levels. And I think you having been doing a lot of your your work remotely also helps um, in appreciating this different perspective of it as well. And coming to your point about access, you know WDC in Vietnam had a, had a hybrid stream where there were, um, I think, about 45 teams or so 
who could who did uh, WDC online. In fact, one of the ESL finals teams from Israel did the final online with the three other teams in person. And so that sort of reflects the access thing that you are speaking about. Um, of course, if 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 um, University of Ghana couldn't attend, for instance, or KNUST or, or UHAS or UNER couldn't attend Worlds in Vietnam and they had signed up for the virtual one, they could still do it, provided they have good network, which is much more easy to access than, for instance, finding money for plane tickets, etc. And so when when you start thinking about the access, I really like understand what you are saying as well. To what degree is is social media playing a role in this? Um, is it enhancing communication? Is it degrading it and drilling it away from its quality? Quite interesting. That is the first exercise that we engage in every communication workshop that we do in my line of work, which is uh, debating on the impact of social media. Yeah. I think it's in the same line as what I said before. It does give access. It does give opportunity to meet people that you wouldn't ordinarily meet. Yeah. However, I would advise against becoming used to the textual and short form content. I believe that becoming overly used to that kind of content can be disruptive and can have some level of impact on one's attention. I remember during times of COVID where we were not talking to people yeah. in person. When we came out of COVID, I remember actually having a conversation with someone and I just said, wow, <laughs> LOL. I actually said LOL with yeah. my lips in real life. And I was shocked to the extent at which my communication style had been impacted. And yeah. I had to work consciously to improve my communication by talking to people. So texts are great, TikTok is great, but in terms of conditioning your mind and in terms of attention, that is why, for example, I would advise everyone to continue listening to podcasts yeah. like these. Being able to train your mind with both short form and long form content, paying attention to something for over 30 minutes, for over an hour, for three hours. Yeah. It does a lot to train your mind to be an effective communicator yeah. and listener because you would encounter people who talk a lot. Yeah. Talk yeah. for an hour. You need to be able to distill everything from that speech and still be able to communicate based off of or based in spite of yeah. that person's delivery. So that is what I think social media can do in terms of potential harm. But there is a way to intentionally navigate it so as to only distill the benefits from it. Yeah, you tend to pick things a little bit different from what everybody is talking about. And I'm going to point one out here. Usually when I ask people about social media questions, the first thing they talk about is attention, whether or not, not necessarily attention span, like you're speaking of in terms of short form versus long form content. It's more about distraction. So for instance, are we distracted so much on TikTok that we don't want to talk to the next person sitting beside us? Or are we distracted so much on Twitter that we don't want to talk to the next person beside us? But what you are talking about is what should be the distraction, even if that's the distraction, which one improves your communication still. So this is showing me an inherent value within social media as a tool to enhance communication. Um, in terms of the kind of content you consume and not necessarily whether or not you are distracted or not distracted, which is quite fascinating as well. Um, have you told stories in any of the speeches you've given or do you make it a habit to tell stories in speeches that you give? Oh, I, I love telling stories. That's... <laughs> I believe stories are extremely powerful. That is why almost every CEO wants to write an autobiography. Yeah. That is why people do tell stories in their speeches, be it politicians, yeah. be it this, that, that, because one thing a story does is that it automatically brings people closer. Yeah. We have a, we have a culture of storytelling. I mean, locally, we go around the, the fire and we talk about Kwekwanansi yeah. and 
Iti Kelly Kelly and all of these people. Yeah. We have stories about myths and legend. And yeah. the history of humanity has been a history of different storytelling techniques. So we have an inherent interest in stories of human beings, even mm -hmm. as children bedtime stories i know that is not the african staple <laughs> having bedtime stories read to you but i mean we watch mm -hmm. movies and we see that then i mean good for them going to bed with a full belly is enough story it's good for, for the african child yeah yes but one thing i've seen or one thing that is just common knowledge is that stories have a powerful effect yeah in communicating aside entertaining it's able to demonstrate a message and that is the quality of storytelling. I can tell you that perhaps patience is key or patience is valuable, but by communicating that lesson through the story of the tortoise yeah. and the hare, yeah. you are better able to appreciate that story. Yeah. It gives you proof. It gives you an experience. It gives you something that is interesting to which you can attach the lesson to. And that is what communication does. That's what storytelling does in communication. So I tend to use as many stories as possible when communicating because of that powerful effect. But also because I believe that stories are viral and yeah. they can go a long way in impacting people. People oftentimes remember the story. Yeah. They may not remember all the facts and numbers and details, but trust me they are going to remember the story yeah and that is one thing they are going to communicate to go abroad and attach to that story attach to that story that they are remembering and communicating and sharing is that little lesson in there is that yeah. takeaway yeah that was the objective yeah. of your speech so for me you can attach a lesson and boost that lesson with the viral quality of storytelling yeah. so as to achieve your effect yeah, this this is true. Like I I recently was telling someone that I think better lessons are learned when people experience something because they remember that experience and the story around it. And it boils down to me myself, like the best debating things or debating the most genuine and profound debating strategies or lessons I've learned have been when I experienced them, and then I could remember and say, in this tournament, in this round, when I met this person, this happened. And I found out that instead of doing this, I should start thinking this way. Ordinarily, I would probably forget because we think up a lot of things and we forget. But because there is a story or an experience attached to it, I can find myself remembering it anytime I want to. Because even if I forget the lesson, it's much harder to forget the story. And anytime you remember that story or that experience, you can always pick up the lesson from it. Like there are so many stories we've heard from childhood and we can always remember them. And I also think that Charlie, lessons are boring. Like every day is a pick a lesson, pick a lesson. But stories are quite interesting and so it's much easier to pick them. Who is your favorite writer, Jeremiah? It's very interesting for me to know because with how deliberate you are with communication i'm interested to know who you would pick as your favorite writer it's difficult to pick one to be very honest it is extremely difficult to pick one but i can give you three okay three writers who are my best okay the first would be chino achibi okay and when it comes to intentionality yeah in communication it's difficult to find a better writer than Chino Achibi yeah. because you read the story of things fall apart. And the way yeah. he just describes the beginning, I actually memorized the first page of things fall apart. Wow. And I read it every year or two. So as to, yeah. I have not read it in about two years, so I will not be able to recite it. But I, I had to memorize it because I, I wanted to keep... Yeah. such a structure with me always to always know what is the ideal in terms of storytelling yeah so chino achibe intentionality choice of words how to make someone feel yeah when reading a book use of rhetoric yeah. proverbs idioms actions he was it was a masterpiece everything he did was a masterpiece more so for things fall apart than anything else 
So that's why it's one of the top 100 books ever written, and for good reason. Next writer, much less known, would be Rick Riordan. Mm. Um, and he wrote um, the Percy Jackson books. Okay. He wrote the Percy Jackson books. And for me, Rick Riordan was excellent because he was able to communicate and add fantastical elements, mm -hmm. add humor, add adventure. And what I picked from Rick Riordan was that he was able to allow the listener imagine. Right? Yeah. So Rick Riordan was able to allow the listener to imagine. You can be reading um, you can be reading a Rick Riordan book, right? You can be reading a Rick Riordan book and yeah. you would imagine this entire world, much like the Harry Potter books, right? Yeah. Many people were never in yeah. London or so, yeah. but people troop in every year to go to King's Cross Station to go visit that because they had built so much of their childhood yeah. on that and it was beautiful for them. So in terms of being able to invoke your reader's imagination yeah. to be able to make them imagine, think, wonder, that is required. And, and lastly, I'll pick Lemony Snicket. He wrote a series of unfortunate events. Ooh. I think the writer's real name is Daniel Handler. I was just searching for it. Oh. He always wrote Lemony Snicket as his pseudonym on all his books. Oh, okay. But the real name is Daniel Handler. And just like how Peggy O'Pong was a pseudonym, yeah, many of us yeah. never knew that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Her real name was never Peggy O'Pong. Yeah. So yeah, I always thought his name was Lemony Snicket. And a series of unfortunate events was a masterpiece in storytelling for me. Yeah. Because it was beyond the twists and turns. It was his use of, should I say, it was, it was just a sheer vain experience in creative ability. Yeah. I believe the man was just there one day and he thought, I have so much creativity in me. And I need to pour. It was the show of the creativity. Yeah. Yes, because the book, I mean, you could start talking about an onion, how cutting an onion is, and then related to how every single stage of the main character's life could evoke crying and it was always so deep in terms of the connectivity, yeah. how to bring everything together in coherence. And from his writing style, that is why I learned how to connect elements in your speech. Yeah. So oftentimes, if you listen to how I speak, I'll begin with a certain story or a yeah. certain objective and end by connecting it there. Yeah. It is reading his books that taught me the value of doing that and the skill or the strategy in terms of doing that sheer creative skill and writing coherence, I'll give it to Lemony Snicket in that. So from all these three writers, I picked and admired them for different things. And yeah. I think they have shaped me in significant ways. I I really envy people who can read. Like, because I'm a lazy reader, I can be very honest. People question why I've I've debated and I've I know a lot and I don't read and I'm like I'm just a lazy reader. So I prefer podcasts, videos. You see me in like lying down in my room and I can listen to four two hour podcasts nonstop, just listening, even when I'm working or doing something. But ask me to read and I'll struggle to finish the first page. So I really envy people who are able to read, identify great writers and stick with them and go on the journeys with them. That, for like 10 years now, it's just two books that I've read. I usually I can, I can sympathize with that. Yeah, I never. I can really sympathize with that. I would say that I, I don't read as much anymore. I do just like you do. Yeah. Because reading is a significant commitment. Yeah. What we're reading does is that you cannot do anything else. Yeah. And in the busy, fast-paced world that we live in, yeah. you want to be listening to a podcast yeah. and you want to be doing something else. But I believe reading is still important. That is why I am 
really struggling to put myself back into reading yeah because it's a skill it's a skill because growing up and moving up the social ladder you are going to be asked to edit yeah. a book yeah. give a forward yeah. for a book do a number of these things yeah proofread perhaps write a long piece yeah. or essay and do all of those things and that is when long reading actually comes to play and yeah. I believe it's a skill that needs to be built painfully. So that is why I am trying, yeah. despite being in the same situation as you have mentioned. All these yeah. books, I, I read them before I was 20 years old. Oh. And for the past five years, I haven't done as much rigorous reading yeah. since then. So I'll say that it's an important skill, despite the struggle and the commitment that it takes. And I mean, yeah. of course, it helps you build commitments, which is... <laughs> an important skill that 21st century yeah males need to learn so yeah that is that is also an addition once every once you know you just jab somebody for no reason what have 21st century males done to you no i mean according to pop culture i mean men are not as committed (laughs) or are afraid of commitment Uh, whereas in the past i mean that was the goal of every person so I mean, we if should, anyone is to catch we should get committed to our book. Yeah. <laughs> to our books, sure, sure, to our books. Of the, the funny thing is, we yeah. get committed to our books, then we'll, not even, we'll even be worse in terms of commitment to women. So, like, we'll, we'll uh, just get more backlash from, from them. Yeah. True, yeah. true. But I, I mean, I mean it, would, it would be difficult to imagine getting more backlash than we do now, but... Sure, it's inexhaustible, I guess. Yeah, I'm sure our father said same, Charlie. We've gotten more than they did. <laughs> yeah, I mean for true. The book that caught my attention, and it's because I because I don't like reading, I even barely go book hunting or researching about books and all that. Like the book that caught my attention was Twenty One Lessons of the Twenty First Century by uh Yuval Noah Harari. Um and it was like a, a description of man, the journey of man, uh, describing how the future could be if you merge infotech with biotech and and merging the human mind with the technology that we are discovering. And there's this whole huge imagination of how the world looks like. And I tend to realize the reason why that book caught my attention is because it's more it's like it's telling the stories within the stories because it's sort of describing things more than it is just giving you information and it's using scenarios and it's using place setting and it's using various actions uh, to sort of evoke your sense of imagination and leading into this last part of the conversation just want to ask are there barriers to communication? Do these barriers vary with people? And how do communicators need to understand or what can you do as a communicator to understand these barriers? Because I tend to realize the barrier to me, like in the book, is probably how if, how, how evoking it is in terms of, does it evoke my sense of imagination? So if you start an introduction, which is much more like telling me facts or telling me things that I'm probably not thinking a lot about or imagining a lot about, probably just leave the book because I, I wouldn't find it nice from the start. But somebody may appreciate that. And so do these barriers to communication vary from person to person? And how would communicators or how should communicators try to go beyond these barriers and understand so people can understand their communications as well? Great. As for barriers to communication, there are a lot. There is what you mentioned, which is the primacy bias, yeah. which is that people do pay attention to the first few things that they hear. Yeah. And what you tell them in the first few seconds would make them decide subconsciously whether you have earned the rest of their time. Yeah. There is the recency bias as well to where people remember most what they hear last yeah and all of these things are barriers to communicating what is in the middle yeah there is as well the attention barrier where someone may be busy may not be so focused and you want to get over that barrier 
to transfer that experience or that that information yeah. to them and the most of all the language barrier which i had a very interesting experience yeah with i was on a flight from amsterdam yeah a number of months ago in october yeah and i was seated beside this very dutch woman okay. who was coming to ghana yeah and she began to smile at me she was a very old woman so yes yeah. let's <laughs> Stay focused. She began to smile at me. <laughs> Why are you putting God rules be, behind the story? Just say your thing. Yeah, I need I need to put God rules behind the story. Before people come to the debate for you, community. Right? Exactly. Knowing the debate community. So very elderly woman began to smile at me, trying to communicate with me. But yeah. here's the twist. She understood no English at all. Oh. And I also understood no Dutch. Yeah. But here's where we were able to have a fruitful conversation for over an hour in that flight. How? And that is what really reminded me of the value of communicating beyond words. Yeah. So she was a very expressive person. And she would just be like, ah, oh, ah. And I could guess that what she was saying was that mm. the flight is a long flight. Yeah. And I mean, she's so very tired. Or she would just point to her PC and just say that, oh, just like she wanted a, a fun movie to watch. Yeah. Or she would point to my PC and ask me what movie am I watching? And is it good? And I would be like, I mean, very good. Ha ha ha. Maybe like, very funny. Or we use a combination of sign language, pointing yeah. it. And I understood her perfectly but yeah. even beyond that her emotions she was concerned about going to ghana and where she was going to stay and all that she was grateful she wanted help with some things and even though we never shared any words yeah i understood her perfectly she understood me perfectly and so i come in, i teach and train a lot of esl speakers a lot of yeah. efl speakers and what I tell them is that, yes, your ability to communicate in the language you're trying to communicate in is limited. Yeah. But your what I tell them is that your ability to speak the language is limited. Ooh. But your ability to communicate should not be limited. That's why they say you are ESL speakers, not ESL communicators. This one so you can be an me. ESL. <laughs> you can be an ESL yeah. speaker, but you can be as an EPL, EPL communicator. Yeah. By adding all of those elements to enrich your communication. Yeah. And that is what I found. So anytime I'm training such people, I tell them that language can be a barrier, but like any barrier. If you want to jump over it and your english ability is here but the barrier is here yeah. the gap that you can fill is by enriching the other non-verbal and emotional yeah. aspects yeah. of communication that can take across your argument or your point beyond just the words that you're speaking yeah 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 hmm this is a very nice way to end this discussion. Sad we have to end it, but like it's it's one of those episodes where every single minute I find something interesting and every single minute has been filled with so much things to explore, to enjoy. And everyone who listens to this, you would you would like want to hear what's up next. It's just one of those episodes. So it's really, really nice to have you, Jeremiah. Um, the Ghanaian debate community and the African debate community and the world debating community have heard from you. Uh, it's been really long since they heard from you. And it's good to hear from you again. Um, hopefully they listen to this and remember that uh, Jeremiah is not yet part of the history books, um, at least not that far back <laughs> to the history books. He's He's on the, one of the fresh pages that we are creating, and and we need to mm, we need to keep you in our memories. Yeah, we need to keep we need to keep you in our memories. Um, I mean, you should you should consider interacting with people within the space a lot. The only barrier is that, of course, you are busy, 
uh, very very busy in this in this in this fast paced world that we find ourselves in. But I'm sure a lot of people would would have unique value interacting with you. Um, and I mean, I would make time for that if anyone yeah. wants to have a discussion and they want yeah. to reach out on LinkedIn or yeah. other social media. I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation. Yeah. I mean, I am very busy and this is a working day for me as well. But yeah. when given this opportunity, I realize that, hey, a conversation with Andrews is obvious. One of our <laughs> debate legends hey, in hey, the hey. global debating community My is always going out. to be an honor and a privilege. And uh, even for other communicators who may not have your long resume of achievements, I believe that every conversation with a debater, at least, or yeah. in, in this space, yeah. has the potential to enrich. And even if I am going to be taking nothing from that conversation, which is rare, speaking to yeah. an intelligent mind, I know that by sharing, I am at least playing my minor role in making yeah. the next generation uh, better for it. So yeah. always happy to have a conversation if anyone wants to reach out. The, their replies may take a bit longer, but yeah. eventually yeah. I will make time. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, for me, like I said, this is this has for some time become the space I learn the most, because interacting with different people, learning from them, learning the things that they know, and also sharing like very unique experiences, um, also with the world. Um, and this is my new way of also interacting with debates, specifically because I can't do a weekend long competitive competition. But I can have an hour okay. conversation with you, and that still makes me feel explore my debating in ways that are still meaningful to me as well. So, thanks very much for hopping on this episode with me, Jeremiah. Um, hopefully, we'll have another one. Yeah, thank you as well. Yeah, something entirely different, um, uh, which would would come to some time later. So, thanks to our listeners uh, and our viewers for joining us on this episode. Um, hopefully. We are able to bring you more. Keep interacting with us. Drop your comments. Um, react to this with your likes. Subscribe to the channel and see you on the next one. Thanks, everyone.